so therefore uh, we are uh, uh, in touch uh, for a bit. So the uh, what I'm going to talk about today uh, very briefly is about the one of the solutions that we have uh, recently launched as part of the national blockchain project, which is funded by the Prime Minister's office uh, through the National Security Council. And Proven is a company that does our implementations. Uh, it's, a, it's actually a, a, a startup. It's a Section 8 company startup completely owned by IIT Kanpur as part of the charter of the National Blockchain Project. And we recently completed the land record registry uh, solution on blockchain for the state of Karnataka. And that will be rolled out uh, this month. And we are doing several other projects. This particular project is something that we have been thinking about, uh, we have been talking about for almost two years now. And one of the uh, reasons is that the data privacy and the, uh, the way we share identity uh, these days uh, through uh, copies of our other card or copies of our pen card or copies of our uh, other kind of identity documents. Uh, in hotels, uh, in various other locations, uh, tend to be sometimes uh, used in the wrong way, in the wrong hand. And uh, our document could be actually used to do uh, 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 purchase other things, create accounts, etc. And therefore, uh, self-sovereign identity is something that we wanted to uh, come up with. Uh, the concept of self-sovereign identity is not new, it is being used in in various countries, especially Switzerland, for a while. And, but uh, what we want to uh, show you is that it has many use cases, some of which may be of interest to CDOT uh, or any IT organization, some of them may be of interest to uh, 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 law enforcement, uh, the uh, service providers, banks, etc. So the question that uh, first we need to understand is what is self-sovereign identity? And then we want to show you some use cases like doing KYC using self-sovereign identity and few other use cases. And then if we have time, we'll talk about self-sovereign identity around the globe, that is where, where else it is being used. So what is self-sovereign identity? So in self-sovereign identity, the user data, that is its identity related data, is completely under the control and ownership of the user. Uh, it is never shared as copy uh, with somebody else, uh, and therefore there is a no uh, there is no chance that somebody can use that to actually uh, identify themselves as you. And uh, also, uh, in, a, in, a, in an idealistic world, the self-sovereign identity also guarantees that there is no central repository of your identity uh, information. Uh, therefore, there is uh, because those uh, repositories then become a uh, big target for uh, cyber uh, attackers to actually get a uh, pretty large database of your identity or uh, address, your phone number, maybe your uh, bank account uh, number. Uh, it could be also uh, your biometric information, etc., etc. But in our country right now, uh, because we have uh, Aadhaar, uh, and Aadhaar is the central repository of identity, so what we are uh, doing is that we are trying to build a system of self sovereign identity where uh, once uh, Aadhaar provides a verifiable potential to you, you can then use it safely. Now, uh, you don't have to do EKYC or offline EKYC or give a copy of your other card to a verifier, whoever wants, it, wants to verify your identity. Similarly, for other credentials, for example, your driving license, uh, your um, uh, degree certificate, your uh, grade point, all this kind of information could be made into the uh, verifiable credentials. So verifiable credentials are credentials that have added features like digital signatures. So therefore, cryptographic techniques can be used to identify you, and uh, therefore uh, you have uh, no uh, reason to share that information as such uh, in any other 
form or in, in, even in the form of uh, signed XML, uh, which uh, is used for offline other verification, for example. And this, uh, the, the format for uh, the verifiable credential is standardized by WWW consortium and therefore it's pretty standard so we can basically have all the different credential providers to actually follow the standard. And then as user, what you have is a digital wallet. And this wallet is where you store your credentials, but these credentials are individually signed by the credential provider. For example, your other credentials would be signed by the other authority, UIDI. Similarly, your driving license would be signed by the, by your uh, the uh, uh, the registration of motor vehicles, or if you if you if you have, have a degree from a university, the university will sign all the different components of that credential. And then you keep this uh, component, this individually signed components, uh, as uh, uh, and use uh, them for proof of your identity or your degree or proof your address or proof your uh, birth date or if you, prove, if you want you can prove properties of your credentials. For example, if you want to prove that you are above 18 or you are a senior citizen above 65, then you can do that without even revealing your birth date. You can do that by what we call the zero knowledge proof. So there would be an uh, irrefutable proof, mathematical or cryptographic proof that the other party will be able to be convinced that you are above 65 or you are above 18 or you are this age. And this, uh, uh, in this model, everybody should, uh, the one one uh, problem in India might be that everybody should have a wallet uh, on their on their phone, digital wallet, and this uh, requires that everybody should have a smartphone at least as of now. And the, the basic ecosystem that we have built is as follows. So we have a public permission blockchain. So it is public in the sense that it can be accessed read, read by others. But in order to put data or in order to uh, you know very validate the data or in order to actually uh, put new data or come to a consensus, you have only permission entities. And this permission entity, uh, this permission entities could be all the different credential providers, all the universities, etc., etc. Uh, that that will be basically running this uh, sort of consortium model blockchain. So what is the use of the blockchain? First of all, every entity should uh, has a digital signature, which means that every entity should have a public key. So these public keys will be uh, actually be available on this blockchain, since blockchain is immutable and not easy to uh, easy to change. The public keys cannot be uh, uh, you know unauthorized. In an unauthorized change of the public key is not going to work. Uh, if, if somebody wants to do that try that but uh, an authorized change of public you may change your public private key pair in that case you can actually do that in the blockchain second thing that is there in the blockchain is that every credential provider will put a particular credential format that is a schema in this blockchain because universities will have a different schema than the other and then the than the bank card and then the than the uh, driving license because they have different pieces of data in them. So, so every credential provider will provide what is the schema because that schema will be needed for a verifier if wants wants to verify your identity to know in what schema the data is there and accordingly it can request the data. Now, the 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 way it works is that the user is the holder of the credential. He has a digital wallet, so he requests to the issuer the uh, the uh, credential so for example first time you want to get your other credential you have to do your kyc with your fingerprint etc and other will send you the verifiable credential each piece of data individually digitally signed and then on the other hand the issuer will also register a schema and credential definition in the uh, blockchain now uh, once you have that let's say after getting your other you actually wants to you want to get a verifiable credential format of your degree. So you go to your university, and then the university is your verifier. So the verifier will uh, request proof of your identity. So you can use your other ID for your identity. 
and then once the once the verifier is satisfied, then it will send you its own uh, credential, your degree credential into. So you get a second second set of credentials in your wallet. And this way, you can accumulate different credentials and bootstrap from the first credential that you had. And then the to verify that that you what you said is correct, it has to go and consult the public key of the credential provider to in order to check the digital signature. And then it also can also consult the schema to know what data to require. So verifiable credentials is basically credentials that uh, that can prove that the issuer of the credential that you are claiming uh, uh, has given you this credential is indeed the issuer. And this is done by using the public key of the issuer from the blockchain. Credential uh, can be also issued to, uh, 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 and the fact that the credential were issued to me and not uh, XYZ, that uh, information will be also there with the signature. And then the credential has not been tampered with. That is uh, proven by the, the, the matching of the hash over which the digital signature has been done. And credentials has not been revoked by the issuer. That information will be again concentrated from the blockchain because say your degree gets revoked, then that information needs to be there. So, so there are many different uh, uh, authorities that can provide verifiable credentials, including other your income tax department, your driving license issuer, uh, various other institutional uh, credential providers. Your vaccine certificate can also be converted to a verifiable credential. So these are uh, these are some of the uh, banks can also give you the then verifiable credential like passbook, front page, uh, etc. Now, uh, so other can be also done. So in a, in an ideal environment where you want to actually be very very uh, self sovereign, uh, you don't have any digital repository. But since we have the digital repository, we are bootstrapping from other. But if you did not, then what would what would have happened is like in Switzerland is that you would create uh, you, uh, your uh, uh, first credential, that is who you are, will be done by your local municipal uh, uh, department or, or whoever can issues you, um, who knows you, and uh, maybe in the presence of witness, etc., that this is uh, Sandeep Shukla, this is his uh, signature, and this is his, uh, uh, this is his uh, public key. All that stuff can be also uh, verified by one individual. That will that will basically mean that there will be no centralized repository, but th that will also depend on the uh, the fact that each uh, person who certifies another person should be also registered with the uh, blockchain system, so that you know they cannot do some random people assigned to a random name and things like that. But in our case, other is there, so we could start with other. Now we can do uh, KYC with this verifiable credentials. So currently, uh, there are many different ways of doing uh, this. Uh, know your customer, like you can go and uh, do in-person verification. You can do eKYC. You can do offline eKYC. You can do video-based customer identification process, as is done by uh, by uh, the uh, certificate when you try to get a digital certificate in your name uh, for. The company board of directors. This is what they use: a video customer identification process, or you can do a TKYC. So all these things have uh, certain uh, uh, problems that that we, uh, you know, in, in this short talk, I will not talk uh, talk about. But it, in all these cases, the data does not reside with the actual person who is the who is whose uh, credential is being talked about. Or proven, it it's, uh, all has to go through some centralized uh, place. Uh, also, in some cases, you you provide the entire uh, you know your other information or your entire um, bank card, but you don't necessarily need to do that to prove. Let's say you want to prove your uh, address from your driving license, you don't need to know your uh, driving license number. Uh, similarly, if you want to prove your age, you don't need to give the other information. So, Things like that. So that that kind of selectivity is uh, not available in any of these methods. So now, the, let's say you want to do a, a, a KYC. So you want to actually uh, use one of these other pan, or you can use a combination of this for proving different aspects of your 
things like Aadhaar can be used for address proof. PAN does not have address proof, but bank needs the PAN to so prove that your PAN actually belongs to you. You may want to prove uh, your age uh, through, uh, through your driving license, etc. Et so you have all these credentials in your wallet, and then you go to the bank, and the bank basically uh, 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 queries you based on the schema for all this that uh, you know give me provable uh, uh, you know credential components. So. So you say that each of these individual components that bank wants with the digital signature from UADI, from the income tax department, from the driving license authority, and then the bank consults the blockchain to check their uh, public key, and then uh, use that public key to check the signature to know that this is actually signed by those authorities, and then it actually gets satisfied. Now bank can actually add another credential in your in your uh, in your uh, wallet by saying that this is my, your bank account number and this is the uh, your uh, name in the bank, etc. So here is a small animation. So Vidya wants to uh, use this uh, SSID. So she has the digital wallet from us. So she first goes to UIDI and UIDI uh, basically uh, gives her uh, other, uh, does an other install KYC through uh, OTP or whatever method that, uh, that works. Then she reads the, the verifiable credential from Aadhaar and goes, goes to uh, her one. Then she goes to IITK and she actually wants to prove her identity through the Aadhaar uh, verifiable credential. So she doesn't have to go back to Aadhaar uh, you know, to do a real EKYC. She can do this directly from her wallet and she receives degree and that becomes uh, in the verifiable credential. Then she wants to apply for a job, there she has to prove her identity and degree. So then she will need both of these previous two collected verifiable credentials and the job gives her uh, a, another verifiable credential uh, taking her salary and, and her terms of her employment, etc. Which and then she wants to apply for a credit card. So she goes and there she actually proves the uh, identity address income and uh, uh, this is a credit card which also can be stored as a completely uh, electronic form in the wallet. Now, <clears throat> so, so the features are digital wallet, selective disclosure of information, not all the information in a particular type of identity, non-transferable proof, so when you say same proof, it cannot be transferred to a third party. So uh, zero knowledge proofs to prove properties of your credential without actually revealing the actual value of the credential like birth date. Uh, Market credential proofs, so various different credentials can be used uh, together. Interoperability between different uh, because the schemas and all the stuff are used from the W3C standard. Secure private channels uh, between the verifier application and the actual uh, SSID application uh, and then autofill form, forms flexible and extensible all that stuff. So benefits are uh, that people cannot easily correlate your activities anymore because all the proofs are being done directly in a self-sovereign way. So you cannot be correlated in a centralized database about your activities. Data minimization, reduced identity thefts, identity frauds, Fewer obligations from the verifiers. Right now, every verification, like a credit card, takes three, four days. Uh, it can be done instantly, and data security also is the benefit. So, one thing that I want to show uh, as an example is the passwordless block uh, login. So, let's let's show the video for passwordless login. So, here. Uh, I want to use my SS, SSID wallet. This is Jay. He has recently turned 18, and he wishes to apply for various services and documents that he can avail as an adult, such as a license, motor card, and so on. He visits the portal all of these services offered by different government institutions and quickly registers on all of these with different passwords. After going through all the rigorous time-taking processes, finally, Submits all his applications and goes to relax after a verification. Few days later, to get an update of his application, Jay decides to check back his application. But unfortunately, he finds it hard to recall all of them. As a result, out of despair, he keeps on trying to reset his passwords. 
So, Bill's stubborn identity helped Jay? Yes, definitely. Jay openly needs to scan the QR code on the portal using the SSI application, and now he can quickly log in using his credentials. Now, he no longer has to remember all multiple passwords. He uses a different identifier for all of these. Hence, no one can correlate it across services and track his ability. I don't know if you got the if you if you could hear the uh, hear the sound. Basically, this is what happens. So uh, you can have either a regular username password login, but nowadays it's becoming very difficult to remember password. And the whole point of doing password uh, username is to identify that uh, whoever is trying to log in is the one legitimate person to log in. But if you can use the other or driving license or some other information to identify him why use uh, username password so that's what is happening so you you basically do a password based sign in then the site will create a, a qr code that your wallet application will uh, will do this scanning and then immediately log you in so this is how we uh, are using the self sovereign identity to create password based uh, password less login Another application is autofill. So, um, if you go to a different, uh, like here is a national eligibility test entrance form, but every time you go to a new form, you have to fill in everything, you make mistakes, etc., etc. But all this information is in one or the other of your credentials. So, why not use that? So, what you can do is that you can enable this website to actually give you a QR code, and what you do is I'll skip the video and uh, so I'll just show you how this works. So uh, this is basically a uh, uh, you know login to this uh, this travel site that we have uh, created. This is not a real travel site. So when I try to uh, go there, I, uh, it gives me a QR code and I you uh, scan it with my uh, my uh, wallet app. And then it will basically get all the information that is uh, required uh, for uh, that is required for this, uh, you know, for all this to fill this up. And we can do more. We can actually do the uh, issuing issuing pass, uh, pa uh, you know, uh, voting pass, etc. Through the whole same process. Selective disclosure is another thing that that a society provides. So selective disclosure is when you want to only disclose a certain uh, parts of your other card or pen card. This is selected for a job at a company. The company asked him to submit his high school mark sheets and graduation degree to verify his educational qualification. But Jay does not want to share all of these documents as they contain irrelevant information like extracurricular performance, special remarks, and personal information. As Jay had no option left. He scanned the required documents and uploaded them to the portal for completing his application. So, can self sovereign identity help Jay? Using SSI, Jay only needs to scan the QR code on the portal. After doing so this, Jay has now the option to selectively disclose only relevant data from his grade sheet by like his name, institute's name and final grade without revealing any other extra information. With this, he does not have to worry about providing so that's the that's the select of uh, disclosure. So uh, the implication is that now this is your credential, let's say health ID number, and you want to uh, only disclose some part of this information. So the, because you want to prove your date of birth and your gender, and not your mobile number, etc. You can you can uh, you know depending on what what who is asking for it, the, the mobile number may be required or not. So the, uh, that, that's the kind of selective credential uh, stuff. Uh, then we have, so the key highlights is that the ecosystem supports selective disclosure, which provides a lot of ease in exchanging credentials between parties and unlock a huge number of use cases. Uh, it's a very flexible and extensible uh, uh, to introduce a new credential. So every time you get a new credential, you can actually add that into the wall. Uh, and it's, a, it's a based on open standards, so therefore it will be interoperable. And you can do instant digital verification of your other, your time, your, uh, your driving license, your degree, uh, your bank uh, statement, or your uh, salary, 
all that is kind of information, if you select to do so, if you select to uh, uh, prove, uh, provide those proofs, uh, and those proofs cannot be refuted by the uh, by the, uh, the entity asking for uh, those things because they are legally signed by the right authority. So, uh, so, and this is compliant with most privacy regulations, GDPR, uh, PDCB, etc. So, uh, I will probably um, uh, uh, skip some of the slides so you can prove your other stuff without uh, the KYC service. Right now, the KYC can be done both online and offline or by giving a printout. Giving a printout is the most insecure one. Uh, you know, it, it has been misused uh, like anything. And then it is used, asked by everybody. Like even the guy who uh, comes to give a, a shipment in my in my house, he says, give me your copy of your order. So, so that kind of uh, misuse of order can be actually stopped by using this. Uh, you can also, uh, you know, uh, use this for uh, various kind of simplifying mortgage application, onboarding clients, uh, apply for credit card, employee verification. You can also uh, do this for uh, travel and transportation like instant COVID vaccination certificate, uh, driving license, travel permits, shipping documentation. And if uh, you know this thing actually becomes widely acceptable, even your passport can become converted to this kind of a uh, So. So there are lots of these use cases. Some of these are very, very useful for us, like password with uh, less login, uh, uh, and then uh, autofill, uh, then uh, instantly opening bank account, etc. They, they, of course, this this kind of work has this one uh, problem that now we are working with uh, the national e-governance department. We are. We are trying to convince the RBI to uh, make it uh, uh, make this as one way of doing KYC. Uh, uh, we are talking to uh, health, uh, the uh, national health uh, uh, effort that is uh, under NCIO to see whether they can they want to use this. So, so unless we onboard all these organizations and all these different uh, uh, credential providers. Uh, this will obviously be you know, not be used very much. So, so that's where we actually are trying to uh, popularize the idea and the idea that uh, I'm trying to actually show the benefits of this. Right now, we are talking to a number of different uh, uh, government entities uh, uh, and RBI uh, once, uh, you know, and also UIDI. So, once this UIDI gets onboarded, I think the other ones will get onboarded easily. So that's where we are. Uh, I have a lot more slides, but I will stop here because I think my time is up. So I don't know if you there is a time for questions or we can we can just uh, finish. Thank you, sir, for sharing your profound insights into self-sovereign identity ecosystem and its use cases in an illustrative manner. Sir, the questions will be shared separately with you on your email. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We are honored to have the gracious presence of Sri Samir Sharma, who is currently a senior advisor, ITU United Nations, and a global lead on ITU flagship initiative Connect to Recover for Digital Infrastructure Reinforcement for COVID-19 Recovery and Preparedness. He has been responsible for sustainable development through ICT 